Amen. Thank you, Miss Elizabeth. And let's go ahead and grab our Bibles. Turn to Matthew 26, verse 50. Matthew 26, verse 50. There's a thought here uh, that I just was blown away at when I, when I kind of comprehended all that was going on here. Uh, a somewhat familiar passage of when he was betrayed by Judas, the kiss of betrayal. Uh, but how Christ responds to Judas specifically is what I want to preach on. But I was just taken back at it as I was reflecting he was born to die, and then looking at the end of his life. Uh, that's what I kind of like to do around Christmas. I love his birth, but then I kind of look at the crucifixion again and re- recognize why he came. Uh, but here, a, a wonderful thought here. And, and by the way, we will, get, we will preach on his birth. I think last year we did those Christmas hymns as my titles and verses with that. So uh, I don't really have anything really like that, but uh, we'll be getting to some of that around the Christmas holiday. But uh, Matthew 26, verse 50. Now, before we read it, I want to read another verse that I don't want you to turn to. I'll just read it carefully, but I'm going to read Matthew 11, 19, what the Pharisees accused Christ of being, and then it played out in his entire life, especially here in our verse, which we're opening with. But in Matthew 11:19, 19, they said of Jesus, they said, uh, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a man gluttonous and a wine bibber, and here's what they said, he's a friend of publicans and sinners. But what an indictment, but what an amazing truth, that he was a friend of sinners. He's a friend of publicans and sinners. I, I, I praise God for that. He's a friend of a sinner, uh, but wisdom is justified in her children. Then our verse, to where he knew exactly who Jesus Judas was, but responds to him when he kisses him with betrayal, identifying who the Messiah was, who Christ was. And then we're going to later lock him up and tr- give him a false trial through the night and crucify him. But he says in verse 50, in verse 50, the Bible says, And Jesus said unto him, Friend, friend. Doesn't that blow you away? He knew the heart of Judas. In fact, he created Judas and knew everything about him and knew how wicked he was. But he calls Judas friend. Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. I believe in verse 50 we see the grace of God, the kindness of God, the patience of God. I think we see a lot in verse 50. Uh, I don't think he's just giving him a greeting. I think he truly was giving Judas one more opportunity to change his ways, to repent of his wicked heart. But still, he still would have been crucified. He's already been betrayed. But this could have been a turning point in Judas, yet it was not. Uh, But in verse 50 it says, Friend. Wherefore art thou come? He calls him friend. The only person he probably could not have called friend, this was not Jesus' friend, but he calls his very enemy a friend. And so I want to preach a message which I've entitled, Jesus, our friend. Now I want to look at just in friendship in general, but I want to ask you a couple questions before we open in prayer. Are you a biblical friend? And what kind of friend are you? What kind of friend are you? We're just going to really think of all this thing about friendship, being a friend, being a friend of God. But let's go ahead and open in prayer. Heavenly Father, would you help me as I preach this morning? Lord, I need your power. I need your presence. I need your guiding uh, hand as we preach this sermon. Lord, I pray you'd help to change our thinking when it comes to friendship and, and friendship and, and, and how we deal with people and talk to people. Lord, I pray that you would help us to have Christian character, not just belief and truth that we, we follow in the Bible, but may it affect our very character may it affect the way we are lord and i pray you'd help us to be friendly and be a friend we pray this in jesus name amen now i'm going to quote a lengthy uh, quote by this guy mclaren and he went into great detail when it comes to this passage he said as the sunshine pours down as willingly and abundantly on filth and dung hills as on gold that glitters in its beam and jewels that flash back its luster So the light and warmth of that unsetting and unexhausted source of life pours down on the unthankful and on the good. The great ocean clasps some black and barren crag that frowns against it. As closely as as with its waves it kisses some fair strand, enameled with flowers and fragrant with perfumes, so so that the sea of love in which we live and move and have our being encircles the worst with abundant flow. He himself sets us the pattern which to imitate is to be the children of our Father, which is in heaven, in that he loves his enemies, blessing them that curse, and doing good to them that hate. Isn't that quite astounding? I believe this this verse alone could solve a lot of our world problems if we understood what it means to be a biblical friend, what it under what it means to, to and how to treat our enemies. And, uh, and it's just an amazing verse, an amazing concept as we think about him calling him friend. You know, there's a hymn that says, Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. Friends may fail me, foes assail me. He, my Savior, makes me whole. Hallelujah, what a Savior. 
uh, saving, helping, keep, uh, hallelujah, what a friend, saving, helping, keeping, loving, he is with me to the end. You see, in this verse, we see another glimpse into the heart of Christ, the heart of Jesus, when he calls Judas his friend. Jesus knew exactly why Judas was there and why, what he was coming to do, yet he still refers to him as a friend, as a friend. What's your heart like this morning? What's your attitude with those around you? This is an amazing illustration of, of God's amazing grace. Uh, think about it this way. How, how Jesus felt about Judas, Judas did not depend on how Judas felt about Jesus. Let me say that one more time. How, uh, how Jesus felt about Jesus, Judas was not how Judas felt about Jesus. See, when I'm the right friend that I should be, whether that's a friend of God or a friend of other people, it's not so much their response to me, but my perspective, my, my position, my feelings, and my attitude, and my character in reference to somebody else. Our response when we are wrong says much about our character. The Lord tells us that we are to be an example in 1 Timothy 4.12. And this verse and this, this idea of him being a friend and calling Judas a friend uh, should, should convict all of us if we think about it deeply. What in the world would we think if we responded to the wrongs in, with, uh, with short fuses and anger and cursing and, and frustration and stress? And, and I know all that presses on us at times, but it's our response to those things that is very important. Now, I want to kind of look at now, in a general sense, what this idea of being a friend means. But in reference to this first idea, number one, being a friend of God. Before we can see of, of God calling us his friend, he was a friend of sinners, I want to really think about of our relationship to God, so our, our perspective to God. Uh, you know, there was someone in the Bible that was called a friend of God. Let's kind of turn over to that. Each of these main points will have a verse. But go over to, to, to James, the book of James, chapter 2. And we're going to look at this verse where it refers to a believer in the Bible that was called the friend of God. And he was eternally called that. The Bible even says uh, in the Old Testament he was uh, a friend of God forever, the Bible says. But uh, look at James 2.23. James 2.23. All right, the Bible says here in uh, James chapter 2, verse 23, uh, and the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. He was called the friend of God. What an amazing title. You know, maybe, maybe some of us want to, want to, would want to be referred to as, as this or that or a different title or a different uh, uh, position of authority. Or maybe some of us are looking to get that manager, manager position or a higher up ranking position in our job. And that, that would bring even uh, some, some uh, positional respect and different things. And especially we do see that in the military. There's positional respect and those that uh, rise up in ranks. And, and maybe that, that there would be some young soldiers that kind of look up to those that are above them and, and kind of view that uh, higher rank as, a, I want that position. Position. But you know what? You know what Abraham wanted to be? You know what his position was? He wanted to be called the friend of God. He was God's friend. Isn't that amazing? Now, God is a friend of everyone. He's a friend of sinners. But he called Abraham. Uh, he, it was, he was a friend of God. He was God's friend. Uh, that was God's friends list. You know, God had a Facebook. He had one friend. It was Abraham. No. But, uh, you know, Abraham was his friend. He friend requested Abraham. They became friends. What an amazing concept, right? Uh, friendship is a theme calculated to make a deep impression upon the mind. Even philosophers, with all their auster austerity and disposition and, and so, so I don't know why I wrote that down. Uh, could, couldn't explain what it means to even be a friend. If you think about it, well, how, how do we get our friends? And sometimes even our friends are our opposites. Sometimes we marry people that are similar. Sometimes you marry opposites. But, but you know, friendship, you can have a friend that's completely different than you. You can have a friend that's exactly the same as you. Uh, but, you know, friendship is, is a hard thing to even define and figure out and why people choose the friends that they choose and what personalities can become friends. But Christianity so far... Uh, from, uh, dis, uh, 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 from cultivating a friendship within the local body of the church uh, goes even beyond societal norms. Because in, in, in a very strange way, as we invite everyone in the community to a local church and we establish God's local church in this neighborhood, we then get a, a wide variety of people and we're to have unity in this place. And, it, and to some degree, it means that we ought to become friends with one another. Well, I don't like that person in that other chair. I don't like the person across the aisle. I, I, don't, I don't want to be their friend. Well... We ought to have unity in this church. We ought to have the spirit of unity, the Holy Spirit leading all of that. We ought to be friends with one another. You know, there's a glorious privilege to be called the friend of God, as Abraham was referred to that way. You know, it's freedom of access. If, if, if Abraham was God's friend, you know what it kind of denoted? And I think it, you could see this played out in the Old Testament and even in the New, that, that he had access to God. 
You know, God didn't always speak with people in the Old Testament. Now, through the, the church, we have the indwelling Holy Spirit, and God speaks to every person, but he didn't always uh, give his spirit to everyone and speak to everybody in person. But there was, there, you know, he did that with Abraham. He spoke to him. He, he was a friend of God. There was, there was access. He would access. You know, there may be people that have uh, positions in the society or in their job or in, in the military, other, other, other branches of the military, and, and they may be hard to get to by other people. Maybe they don't have direct access uh, by, you know, not everybody has their cell phone number or their address or, 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 or access to, to, their, uh, to their ear at times. But you know what? If we're a friend of God, we always have access, freedom of access. It also gives us the idea that we can exercise, um, uh, we can exercise a charitable and sympathetic disposition of that friend. If they're a friend, they'll want to hear what we have to say. They'll, they'll give us an ear. And I think that's what uh, uh, an overwhelming principle about friendship is we are willing to listen. And so if I'm a friend of God, I'm, I'm willing to listen to God. I'm willing to hear what he has to tell me. And as we look at God's word, we, we ought to see what he's telling me to do. We see what the interpretation of that verse is. We, we know what it means. And then we apply it to our life and we listen to what God has said. If God says, be a kind one to another, then I, then I understand that he's telling that church in and, and, and Ephesus that Paul's saying that you guys got to be kind. That's, that's what he means to those guys. Uh, but for me, I ought to be kind one to another. I make the application to my life. So there's a, there's a, there's a disposition to listen to a friend. There's also confidential communications. Isn't it wonderful to think about the communication I have with my Heavenly Father? I can go to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. I don't have to beg for him to listen to me, but I have intimate and, and, and beautiful interaction with my Father. I can ask him anything. It can be the smallest thing. God, I, I need 50 cents for a you know, candy bar or something like that. And God says, all right, you know, hey, we're friends. I don't mind. Yeah, I got 50 cents. No problem. God, I need a million dollars, you know, or whatever. Uh, but maybe you really need it or something, but, you know, God will provide. God, God says, hey, hey, I'm your friend. Hey, friends, do that for one another. And if I'm coming for you to listen, you know, I, you ought to listen to me. I ought to listen to you. But there's confidential communications. And also, there's, a, there's an administration of counsel and reproof. You know, a friend will tell you not what you, what you want to hear, but what you need to hear. And so often when God, even as our friend, it shows that there'll be times where he's going to tell some hard sayings, some things that are difficult to hear, but I ought to be corrected. My behavior must be corrected. So to be a friend of God, there may be some confrontation. There might be some, uh, some issues that need to be addressed if I'm a friend of God. And also there is suitable blessings. Think of this friend. Now, we, we aren't friends with God because of what he can give us, but he owns everything. But think about my friendship with God. I got a friend. Hey, I know a guy. Hey, he sits in heaven. He owns everything. He's in control of all things. That's my friend. Hey, I, I, yeah, I'm sure you got a lot of friends, but I got the only friend that matters. So there's a, there's a special privilege and suitable blessings with the friend when I'm called the friend of God. Now, we'd have to ask our questions, too, as we keep d d d diving into it. That's all the privileges I enjoy with the friendship of God when we think of being a friend of God. But then what is the nature of that friendship which, uh, which uh, exists between God and his people if we d dig a little bit deeper? Well, it, that friendship includes knowledge. How can I truly be a friend of God if I know nothing about him? Am I truly his friend? Are we truly friends? If there's a, if there's a person you call a friend, you never talk to them, you know nothing about them, you don't even know their middle name, you don't know any of their family, you don't know their pets, you don't know their, where they work, you don't know anything about them, you don't, maybe you don't even know what they look like. And how could you call that person a friend? It'd be silly to think about that, right? But there's some of us that we say that God, that we're in a relationship with God, that he is our friend, that we know God, but we know nothing about him. Hey, in one way, this is his friendship letter to us. And we say it's his love letter, often for our relationship to God. Uh, as he wrote the Bible, he gave us his words to us. But we ought to understand who God is. The Bible describes God. The Bible talks about who God is. The Bible shows us who this friend that we have is, uh, being a friend of God. So there's some knowledge. There's some likeness and agreement. You know, it's funny, too, that friends will sometimes act like each other. And even if they are different when they become friends, after a period of time with that friendship, there, there's, a, there's a likening to one another. So I believe that Abraham started to act like God. He became godly. He became spiritual as he was a friend of God. He wanted to be like God. And I, I won't say it the other way around because God doesn't need to be like man. But there's definitely with this friendship, this being a friend of God, there's likeness and agreement. There's also a strong affection with a friend. 
There's many people that they would do anything for a friend. I'll, I'll, I'll die for that friend. And we say that with family, but often you can, your friends can be closer than family because you pick your friends. You can't pick your family. And so often some people are very devoted to their friends. Hey, that's my friend. You don't talk to my friend that way. You don't talk about my friend that way. That's my friend. Being a friend of God, we then stick up for our friend. We, we in one sense, uh, there's strong affection, there's strong desire, there's strong connection with our friend, being a friend of God. And also mutual confidence, uh, free and delightful intercourse. We already talked about that. Uh, d- discourse with speech and a disposition to please, honor, and serve that friend. I want to do anything I want, uh, do anything I can for that friend. You know, boiled down from this verse, as we, as we look at just verse 23, all that Abraham did to be called a friend of God, first you believe God. To become a friend of God. If you want this first point to be your, be in your life, you ought, to, you ought to believe God. The first thing we see about Abraham is that Abraham believed God. There's many people that don't believe God. They believe man. They believe what their education has taught them. They believe the words in, in, a, in a written book of education. And that there's some good stuff there. There's some knowledge to learn. But we ought to believe God. Believe God at his word. The biggest sin of Hebrews is unbelief. They didn't believe God. They believed that Judaism was better than Christianity. If you look at Hebrews, that's, that's what their sin was. You're, you're in unbelief. You're in unbelief. You know, you know when he talks about the sin that doth, did so easily beset them or that, that tripped them up? It was unbelief. Now, it may manifest itself in many ways, but the root cause was unbelief. They didn't believe God. He, uh, he, he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he's a rewarder. But he, we first believe that he is. We believe God. Number two, we accept God's way. Look at verse 23. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed or put to his account unto him for righteousness. Abraham recognized that he needed his friend to declare him righteous because he was not righteous. And that's what we have as a believer. We have declared righteousness. I'm not righteous. I'm a sinner. Now I may be saved, but I'm a saved sinner. I need God's righteousness. I can't be right. I need God to make me right. And so Abraham understood that way back in the Old Testament and it was was declared of him, being that he was a friend of God, he was declared righteous and gave us the example of the declaration of righteousness for every believer when we trust God and his way of salvation. So there's, there's even an application to that. It was God's way to be saved, trusting who God was and that God would send a redeemer that could save his soul. So Abraham believed God's way of doing things. Not his own way, not his self-righteous way, not religion, false religion's way, but God's way. And then also from verse 23, we also see that you can, uh, you can have, uh, you have God's friendship when you believe God and you go God's way. In verse 23. So this is all under that uh, first idea, being a friend of God. You know what Exodus 33, 11 says? And the Lord spake unto Moses face to face, as a man speaketh unto his, uh, unto his friend. In 2 Chronicles 27, it says, Are art not thou our God, who did strive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gave us to the seed of Abraham, thy friend forever? I love how it was just tagged on to his name. And then later on, when it talks about Abraham, uh, God is speaking through uh, Isaiah. He says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. I believe why God blessed uh, the seed of Abraham, because it's God's friend. Hey, I'm going to do right by my friend. He followed me. He believed me. I'm going to bless him. John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what the Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Number two now, I want to look at another thing when it comes to being a friend and even Judah saying, I, uh, you know, uh, friend, why'd you come here? And number two, being a friend of the world. Now, all that we said so far is we need to recognize we are a friend of God, not a friend of this world. So there's definitely, we're, we're, we're to be friendly, you know, with everyone, but, uh, and, and, and we're to be God's friend and be, you know, and hopefully he declares us his friend, but we're not to be a friend of the world. Now, go over to James 4. So you should already be there, but go to James 4 and look at verses 2 through 4. So James 4, 2 through 4. So beginning of verse 2 there, it says, uh, You lust and have not, you kill and desire to have, you cannot obtain, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. You ask and receive not because you ask it amiss, and you may consume it upon your lusts. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know you not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? 
Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is, is the enemy of God. Look at that. Look at verse 4. The adulterers and adulterers. Now, it's not saying that we've all, uh, been, uh, uh, we've all cheated on our spouse. He's saying, but if you cheat on me and you say you love me and you're not monogamous in your relationship with me as your God, and you're not my friend, and you're, you're the friend of the world. You're not following my way. You're following the world's way. You're not following my love and my relationship. You're following the relationship of the world and, and the world's love. Don't, don't be uh, out of relationship with God. But in verse 4, it says that we, uh, if we love the world, we become friends with the world, then we, it's, it's at enmity or it's against God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, many of you know me. Uh, I'm a friend to anyone. I can friend anybody. I can be, I can, uh, rather, I can be friendly to anyone. And so uh, that's kind of the way I'm made up. It's kind of how God created me. Uh, so it's not so much that we can't be friendly, but it's when we come close, intimate interactions with the world where, where, where our only friends, our only circle of influence is all unsaved people, this world, this lost world. Are we God's people? Let us then realize the closeness and sacredness of our relation to him. He will not, uh, not allow any other being or object to, be, to share with him the throne uh, of the heart, but, but resents every attempt and suggestion of the kind. And forget not that the world is foreign and, and, and hostile in its power. Friendship with it is enmity with him. You know, there's a lot of things that I love in this world, but everything pales in its comparison to my love for God. My love for God is number one, and as should be your desire as well. You may have other interests and desires and, and affections and things in this world that you may, may love to do or like to do, or that you're, you're people that you're friends with, but all comes secondary to my love for God and my friendship with God. So we ought not to be a friend of the world. Now, this same author went on to say, he said, see how you may be admitted into his friendship, yea, how you may have uh, your maker as your husband. Surely it were a blessed thing to be thus united to one such great and gracious, one who can supply our every want and deliver us from every evil, one who can be infinitely more to us than the nearest and dearest uh, of earthly relatives. His grace alone can draw us into, uh, into and fix us in the state of spiritual wedlock. How, uh, uh, and how are any made its subjects? It is only the way of being abased, emptied of our own self-sufficiency, uh, divested uh, of all fancied merit, and laid at the feet of Jesus when I understand that he ought to be my friend. And my total and utter commitment and satisfaction should come from Jesus Christ, not the world. The friendship of the world is enmity with God. Now, uh, let's go ahead and, and uh, look at another perspective of this. Now, um, uh, let's go over Matthew 26, our text. So it, maybe you're already there. Maybe you turned to James. But I want you to go back to them when he calls Judas a friend. So how can we, re how can we reconcile all this? If we're, a, if we're a friend of God and we can't be a friend of the world, so why does Jesus call Judas a friend? It almost is, is in contradiction to what he's, he's said over and over again in the Bible. But Matthew 26, again, look at verse 50. Um, it says that Judas, and Jesus said unto him, uh, uh, it said to Judas, friend. Wherefore art thou come? Well, I think this just plays in part to what, who Jesus was, uh, giving him that opportunity to accept him as Savior. So really, when we think about Judas' uh, 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 what he what heard of Christ, calling him friend, I think it just shows the grace of our Lord. He was a friend of sinners. He came and dispelled any argument that he was against certain people. See, what had happened in false religion at the time, you had these Pharisees and Sadducees, that they wouldn't eat with publicans and sinners. Oh, you do that, or you have this occupation, or you're this way. I can't be around you. Uh, you know, so they took the separation in the Old Testament so extremely that they wouldn't even eat with somebody else. They wouldn't, they wouldn't even dine with somebody else. They wouldn't even sit at the same table with somebody else. If you remember even that one, uh, one passage where uh, that woman came in with, the, with the, the ointment and falls at the feet of Jesus and weeps and washes his feet with her tears in her hair, and, and, and that Pharisee is just, just confused by that. Why are you letting this woman touch you? Not, not, let alone she was a sinner, but, but this woman, this woman's touching you, and she's a sinner. She's, she's in a lot of sexual sin. We know around town. Why would you even let her touch you, Jesus? But I think it shows us the grace of God that he wants to be our friend, that he, he allows anyone to come to him in belief of him. See, this was, a, this was an extension of friendship. No matter if it was the one who would eventually lead to his arrest, trial, and execution by the cross, he still hands out his spiritual handshake and says, hey, would you be my friend? 
Would you follow me? Would you repent of this wickedness? He probably would have still died. It was in God's plan. But Judas could have got right in this moment. There would be nothing, uh, as far as I know, and I didn't really think about this too deeply, but I don't think there's anything that would have contradicted prophecy if he would, would have got right here. There would have been nothing, in my opinion, that, that would, have, would have canceled anything out. He would, could have still entered the trial, but Judas could have got himself right. I mean, Peter got himself right, right? He preached on uh, the day of Pentecost, Acts chapter 2. He gets right after he denies the Lord three times. So definitely some of the other apostles make it right. Not saying that Peter was equal to Judas, but, but he calls him friend. Why you come? He knew exactly why he was come. Often we ought to treat our enemies that way. We know why they're coming. We know why they're accusing. We know what they're saying. We know what they're doing. We know the kiss of betrayal. We understand our enemy at different times. Maybe we don't understand it completely, but we ought to extend them a way to get it right. You know, the Bible even words it this way. When we respond, uh, not in vengeance, but we respond in kindness and love, it's like keeping coals upon their head. It, it, should, un, it should show them that I, I take a higher road. Hey, all day long, the world out there responds the way, that, the way you think you should. Well, I'm just going to give them what they deserve. I'm going I'm I'm to exact revenge on that person. That's my enemy. I've got no kindness for that person. But yet Jesus calls them friend, even from the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. We often have seen the grace of God throughout his entire life, especially in the moments where he was crucified and put on the cross, even dying in in agony and in pain. He says, forgive them. Boy, what an amazing example we have in Christianity, the Savior. We, We see the patience of Christ's love. See, love should be patient. It's described that way in 1 Corinthians 13 in the love chapter. It ought to be patient. It ought to suffer long. The Bible even words it that way. Suffer long. It should, it should go through lots of suffering, but it should have a long fuse. My love is, is, is in contradiction to my anger. It should be a long fuse. That should be in my marriage. That should be with my kids. That should be with other people. That should be even with my very enemies. His love was very patient. The betrayer, in this very instant of his treason, has that changeless tenderness lingering around him from the lips of the Savior. Friend, why you come? Number two, we see the pleading of Christ's patient love. From that statement, we see the extended hand. There's an appeal for the traitor's heart, an appeal to his conscience. You know, sometimes you can make enemies friends. Now, in the childhood uh, uh, school ground, you know, it's kind of played out that way. You know, sometimes two boys will fight, and afterwards they become friends. You know, they kind of just work it out. And I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that you should punch your friend, but sometimes in the schoolyard we can see that happen, that uh, you can get past an argument, uh, whether it comes to physicality or not, you can get past even physical things, and you can become a friend of someone that at one time was your enemy. And so there was that extended hand, that pleading of Christ's patient love. And he must begin with rebukes that may, uh, may advance to his blessings. And number three, the possible rejection of pleading of Christ's patient love. We can resist his pleadings. It's so easily done. And it comes even to our friendship with our enemy. We can resist that. We can deny it. We can refuse to extend kindness. We can refuse to be gracious. We can refuse to be patient. We can be short with people. We can have our fuse very, very, very teeny and let it fire off on people. We can let people have it. We can exact vengeance. But all this is not Christ-like. It's not our example. He even offers uh, that, that, uh, you know, that, that, uh, that hand of friendship, that, that word of friendship, but it, could, it was rejected, and often it can be rejected from us. As we, as we understand and we take, take to heart this sermon, this message, we can then be a friend of our enemy, but we need to recognize that they may reject our advancement. So even if you say, well, I'm just going to be friendly. I'm going to change my attitude. I'm going to change my character. I'm going to change the way I look at my enemies. You know, we need to understand that even in that moment, they may still respond incorrectly. And Judas does. He even goes out and hangs himself. He felt sorry for it. He was sorrowful, but never led led to repentance. He committed suicide as a result. And I think it might have been from verse 50 and, and, and the events after verse 50. It's an amazing perspective. The submission of Jesus... You know, really, he submits to this whole ordeal in in one kind of way. Uh, He could have avoided Judas. He he knows everything, but he didn't. We can avoid our enemies, but sometimes it's good to confront. He endured the kiss. He called him friend or companion. And that kiss is a token of allegiance and friendship even uh, in and of itself. You know, what what does it mean when we draw close to someone and kiss them? 
Now, this was that Middle Eastern kiss. It wasn't on the lips or anything, but that side kiss, that Italian-type kiss. What does it mean when you draw close and kiss someone? That's an intimate thing. A, 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 even a friendship. I mean, you've got to draw that person in. You've got to not care how they smell or what they look like or uh, how oily their skin is or whatever can, can inhibit you. But that kiss, it took a lot to even portray the Lord for him to do that, to show that this, you know, I'm going to use the act of friendship to betray you. Yet he still calls him friend, knowing all things. And so there's a closeness even in that moment with his very enemy. He was one of the twelve, the vilest, wretched lurk in the best of company. Think about who his teacher was. Jesus Christ was his teacher, was his mentor. He could have changed his ways. So let's not get discouraged when others don't change their ways because of our friendship, and you're not perfect like the Lord. And once probably Judas had been a sincere friend to Jesus. Maybe at the beginning he was more of a friend, and, uh, but maybe not. It's hard to tell that. But, but either way, that it, the extension was made. He was called a friend. How are you like with your enemies? Do you just give them what they need to hear? Do you, do you just hold bitterness and hatred for your enemies, those you don't like, those that have done wrong to you? Hey, you, you ought to remember what has happened and not be, not be uh, unintelligent, not be foolish when it comes to what they've done. But, uh, but we ought to be friend. We ought to be friendly. Remember, uh, as we said in the beginning, it wasn't so much uh, uh, the enemy's view of Christ, or Judas' view of Christ, but how Christ viewed his enemy. So it's all about our perspective. Hey, guess what? Your enemy's not in church. At least I hope not. Uh, your enemy's not here. I can't preach to them, but I can preach to you. I can teach you. I can aim for your, for your behavior and your character. It's how we respond to the world around us. There's been things that have been done to me in the past five years of the church. The people that I could probably even call enemy in one sense or another. But I've chosen not to. There's a lot of things that my dad did to my mother that are ungodly, un, unbiblical. Uh, you know, there's, they've been separated since I was two years old. There's a lot, of, a lot of issues there in the past. But I've chosen to be kind and loving and forgive and move on and not be bitter. And there's a lot we could treat our enemy like or those that have hurt. But it's all about our response. By the way, there is, there is nobody that should be able to walk in this room that you couldn't just accept. Just, they could be here. It wouldn't cause a problem. If, if it causes a problem, you don't have the nature of Christ and calling his very enemy a friend. It's not that we, that we then become buddy-buddy and do everything with that person and let them hurt us again. We're, we're careful, but we can still extend that kindness and that love and that forgiveness. Remember, Christ said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The ones nailing the, the nails in his hands and sides and all that, uh, even in that moment, with all that pain, still responds with forgiveness. Let's go ahead and close our uh, eyes and bow our heads. Everybody, uh, bow your heads and close your eyes. Let's ask you a couple of questions this, this uh, morning. Uh, Lord, would you please direct our hearts and help us to change any area, even reference to some of our friends? What kind of friend are you? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. But let me ask you a question here. Who would say, Pastor Dave, would you pray for me? My character needs to change in reference to some of the people that are around me, whether enemies or distant friends, or I'm just not the friend I need to be. Now, this is just in reference to you being the friend you ought to be to other people. Uh, so, but God's directed me to make some changes. He's shown me some behavioral differences I need to make. And I need to be a better friend uh, to those around me. Anybody like that? God's shown you just your... Uh, you're lacking in your friendship to others. I see those hands. Anybody else? You can put your hands down. Uh, really, all, all, all over the room, you can put your hands down. Thank you for being honest. Who would also say, you know, when it comes to my family, I'm not treating them even as a, as a friend. I'm treating them like uh, inferiors. I'm treating them like, like they're, they're less than a friend. But in, in my family, with my kids or my spouse, I'm not treating my kids or spouse the right way. And God showed me a few things even in my, in my marriage or with, with how I parent that I need to be just more friendly with those in my immediate family. Anybody like that? I'd like to pray for you. I see those hands. Oh, thank you for being honest. I wasn't sure uh, God led me to say that. Uh, let, let me ask you another question and we'll end right here. Who would say, you know, as you were preaching, Pastor, I just thought of some enemies that I need to make sure my attitude's right. It's just not right right now. And God showed me that. And in reference to my enemies, I need to treat them like Christ tre treated Judas. Friend, why'd you come? Why are you doing that? And I need to try to impact even my very enemies. And God showed me that this morning. Would that be anybody like that? Just raise your hand. I'll pray for you as we close. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. Anybody else? God showed me some things about my enemy that I need to make sure my attitude's correct. Thank you for being honest. I see that hand. Thank you so much. 
All right, let's go ahead and close in prayer. A lot of honesty this morning. I know it takes a lot sometimes to answer, uh, raise our hand for some of these issues. And, uh, and, and let's go ahead and close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for each and every person and the many hands that went up for different kinds of questions. And Lord, I would not uh, begin to say that I understand all these situations. And some of these could be things that have never been told to me. But I pray for each and every person that you convicted of for their friendship to other people, whether in their family among their immediate friendship and their friends, and also even their enemies. Lord, I pray you'd help us to be right. We can't always change the behavior in others, but we can change the behavior in us. Let's be quiet at this moment during the invitation. But I can change my behavior. I can change my attitude. I can be the friend I ought to be, no matter what the response is. And I know even when we make a commitment like this, the devil likes to pinch our enemy. The devil likes to pinch our friend at times and, and, and oppress even those around us and test our decision in this moment. And I pray that we would have made a long-lasting decision that's not based on response, but based on position of what the Bible says. And I pray you'd help us to have this perspective. We thank you for it, Lord. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, real quickly, don't forget, right after this, in about five minutes, we're going to have Brittany come out. She's going to kind of explain how things are being decorated. So if you can, hang out for a little bit. We'll get some coffee going if you need some more of that. And uh, also, don't forget, 6 o'clock service tonight. But uh, you are dismissed. Thanks for coming. The kids' ministries will be done in a little bit, I'm sure. We'll let them know.